Please, John, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Dugo. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Herrera from the University Hospital of Leon in Spain. And it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Ivo Boskowski. He's a gastroenterologist and digestive endoscopist at the Catholic University of Rome. And uh, he will give a speech about the future perspective of operative endoscopy in esophagogastric cancers. Ivo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, you can see my presentation. Yes, we see it very well. So thank you so much for the invitation. It's really exciting to work together with surgeons, especially in a topic like this, because this is really a um, delicate uh, uh, topic, uh, treatment of uh, gastric, gastroesophageal malignancies, especially of gastric malignancies, and um, what we do as endoscopists to help surgeons and to help patients that uh, have issues after uh, the surgery. So what we usually see after surgical interventions, um, um, the foregut are anastomotic, anastomotic ulcers, stress ulcers, anastomotic deficiencies, fistulas, post cholecystectomy, and post liver resection fistulas if the interventions are complex and so on. Uh, sometimes we treat pancreatic fistula, it is very, uh, more rare in these uh, situations, but these are the, the, the most um, affected um, areas in the foregut upper. So we, we uh, treat uh, um, endoscopically this situation. So for us endoscopists, you should know that ma mainly we are gastroenterologists. So um, uh, first of all, it is important to understand the anatomy of what you surgeons do and then how to apply the best treatments in these cases. So uh, it all comes from surgery, uh, endoscopy in these uh, cases when you use um, uh, difficult treatments and uh, when we use uh, approaches uh, uh, from uh, the mouth, we do what surgeons do, but we do it from inside. This is a slide given from uh, Professor Ferretta from Strasbourg to me, and I like it very much, but we do also treatments endoscopically, as resections, dissections, and so on. So I concentrate only on the endoscopic treatment. So it is very important to start from physiology. Uh, to understand the mechanisms of every single organ, of every single tube, of the esophagus, of the stomach, and so on, before treating. Why did it, it is important? It is important because high pressure and high tension on, on, the, on the tissues after suturing uh, and low vascularization are uh, probably the main problems linked to the links uh, linked to to the adverse events that uh, potentially can arise and then that we should treat and then the treatment is leaded from the physiology that is on the basis i invite you to read uh, this is very uh, nice review on gut feelings and mechanical sensing in the gastrointestinal tract that really explains everything and how um, treatments can be done um, and, and uh, from where we should we should start so uh, in endoscopy, we have a lot, a lot of uh, um, uh, approaches that can be used. We have uh, many, many devices. You see here over the scope clips, you see uh, esosponges, you see uh, suturing devices and so on. So uh, lately we are concentrated on uh, um, those that work uh, the best. So it is important to understand if you should drain the patient or, or we should close the defect. So how do we classify uh, uh, the issues and the, the leaks and, and deficiencies and when uh, we should treat those depends very much on when the patients come to us. So if you see here, uh, we consider acute less than seven days, early seven to 45 days, late 1.5 to three months and chronic three months. So. Um, the efficacy in the endoscopic treatment is uh, as soon as possible. When we do the treatment, we should do as soon as possible the treatment in order to have the best effective uh, results. So unfortunately, most of the cases from other hospitals come lately, uh, especially after bariatric surgery, uh, just, just as an information. And uh, um, when we treat late patients with, with problems because already uh, they are drained by the surgeon, so the, the sepsis is not anymore an issue. Um, when we treat late, uh, we have a lot, a lot of problems in um, establishing good treatment. Uh, and this is mostly due to the fibrosis that is created. So 
this is uh, what we see mostly uh, when um, uh, the, the, the situations, uh, when the patients come after a long period of observation or nothing has been done, or, or only the patient has been drained. So collections usually tend to, to create disasters with adjacent organs. Um, this is a video of suturing with a pullover stitch device of a um, total gastrectomy patient with total gastrectomy and a small dehiscence of the uh, esophageal jejunal um, uh, anastomosis. And uh, we treated immediately these patients and the result was really amazing. So uh, the patient was already re, uh, um, drained surgically. And uh, you can see here uh, in a while, uh, there is a small hole uh, around three to five millimeters at, uh, at um, um, five o'clock here. And uh, um, this was, um, you see it. This was solved very, very nicely with a double layer of suturing, 2.0 uh, 2 of polypropylene with this suturing device that goes on the endoscope. Now we have uh, the further generation of this that goes to every kind of a gastroscope. Here we use uh, a double channel endoscope for, um, for uh, this uh, purpose. And it is really uh, uh, skills demanding, but not so difficult to perform it. The skills here are very important in order to perform um, double layer suturing because uh, the space is very, very restricted. And I will show you the final results of this uh, with a double la layer uh, that everything is closed and the patient recovered very, very in, uh, fastly. So um, another uh, weapon that we have in endoscopy are esosponges. Uh, this is a case of a patient with a very large opening um, um, of the distal esophagus. And uh, we changed several esosponges here and it worked very nicely. Uh, this is the esosponge. There is also endosponge, endosponge is used for the rectum. And you can see here the cavity just close to the heart and the sutures of the surgeon, you see uh, the drainages. This is a very, very bad collection. Uh, the patient it was a very young patient, 45 years, had already two cardiac arrests. And we treated this case very easily uh, with um, placement of uh, up to four as a sponge per session. And uh, um, these are placed at, at minus one, uh, 125 millimeters mercury. And uh, at the end, the results are, are really uh, amazing. In, in one month, in 1.5 uh, uh, months at the end, um, you have excellent results with with these uh, devices. Usually we use also uh, X-ray. So you see the granulation, you see how nice the effect is. So, um, and we use this very well, very often in the mediastinum. You see uh, how it closes uh, slowly and gently. And at the end, uh, there are no uh, leaks. This is the final appearance. Another um, um, thing that we use and was introduced very, very recently, let's say two weeks ago, is the uh, VAX tent. And uh, this is a case that I did uh, just a few days ago. Um, you can see it here. Um, this is uh, Ivor Lewis, uh, the patients of the anastomosis. And we tried with the vax, with the esosponge, but it didn't work. So you see here, small opening at the other end, small opening, and here, um, um, a large uh, uh, collection where the contrast goes and uh, um, the stent is placed very easily under fluoroscopy. We uh, place it usually with a severe uh, wire. Uh, you need a severe wire to place it. And then um, it goes uh, in the, in, uh, over the wire. You see here the placement of the wire. I like uh, leaving it in the duodenum because it's much more stable. Uh, you can see the stomach that is tubulized and pulled up and we are working in the mediastinum here. So the stand goes over the wire. This is a three uh, centimeter in diameter stand and the length is seven centimeter. It is standard. And then over the stand, there is uh, the sponge, uh, the same from the VAC system. It's called the VAC stand. And then once the stand is placed, uh, there is a blue tube that uh, is connected to a um, section at uh, minus 125 millimeters of mercury. And this stent is exchanged every five to uh, seven days. And it works really, really nicely. You can see 
um, we're waiting for the results of this. But this, these treatments do not work always. Um, so um, we are uh, working on uh, new technologies and uh, new ways of treatment of these patients. So um, the chronic fistulas are the biggest problem. So uh, we develop a new technology of uh, um, uh, fat processing. This is not the same um, way that orthopedics use uh, the fat and it is used also in plastic surgery. We found a way of filtering the fat in, uh, with precise filters that give the best concentration of the mesenchymal cells. So you can see here, um, uh, you can see here uh, the fistula that we treat, uh, try to treat by every mean here, by every means that it uh, was uh, connected directly with the lungs, with the bronchi. And just after injection of um, uh, one cc of fat at one week, this was the situation, this patient. So it closed immediately. Um, out of um, 500 cc's of fat, we use only a very small portion, that is this one. So uh, we drain this, we throw this, and we use only this one. It is one, one cc, literally, that is injected in the fistulary area close to the opening. And uh, we arrived to this concentration of mesenchymal cells after many, many, many experiments uh, with immunofluorescence analysis of the expression of smooth muscle actin that is um, explained here in red and the mesenchymal cells that you can see all these dots that are around. So we found these precise numbers of the filters that uh, are, are used. And this is open access. You can find it on gastroenterology and the exact recipe that should be used. Moreover, we found more than 200 anti-inflammatory biocomponents that are inside that um, really reduce the inflammation. And uh, when this material is injected also in the dehiscences and in the uh, mucosa around, uh, it creates rapid microvascularization of the tissues and um, a rapid healing of the, of, the, of the chronic fistulas and acute uh, dehiscences. Another um, approach that we do is with nanocomposite uh, materials. Um, we did several experiments on pigs by creating fistulas with uh, T-tubes from the esophagus, uh, from the cervical esophagus to the skin. By so injection of the nanocomposites inside the, uh, the fistulas from the endoscopic side, we see, we, we, we found very, very fast um, closure of the tracts and uh, um, the particularity of these materials is that you can see uh, this is under uh, electron microscope. These materials can bring any kind of material, can bring antibiotics, can bring mesenchymal cells, can bring uh, um, materials that can be found uh, in the nature. And uh, um, this aspect is very important. Inside, there are um, molecules of water that are delivered to the cells and oxygen, and this gives live to the tissues. So for acute and chronic problems, this is um, one of our best uh, ways for the treatment. So we're waiting for the human phase of this uh, um, um, research here. Another front is this one, um, the creation of the tissues. Uh, what is the problem with the, with the, the, the scaffolds is that when you uh, create scaffolds and when you place um, stem cells inside, there are a bunch of stem cells and, and, and those stem cells are lot around, then um, they die simply because there is not enough food for all these cells. So by, um, you see here this decellularized esophageal tubular scaffold microperforated by quantum molecular resonance technology, basically what we do, you see all those here, this is a, a printing way of all the uh, stem cells in the scaffold and every almost every stem cells survive and creates all the layers of the esophagus and it's it's really really impressive to see this uh, growing in a lab why is this is important this is important for surgeons and for endoscopies because you can create patches of your own patient in the lab and put them in, in the, where there is a defect of substance, where you have dehiscences. Um, and the idea is to create these uh, materials in high-risk patients before surgery. So when the surgeon is create the, creating the anastomosis, can just put this around with the same tissue of the patient that is, um, brings life to the tissues 
and helps uh, re um, rejuvenation and also uh, can be <coughs> should be placed endoscopically uh, in in other phases you can see here all the layers in the esophagus of the esophagus and the esophagus itself in in a porcine model of course these are the new frontiers that we are aiming to and uh, we hope to give uh, rapid answers um, to all the problems in uh, foregut surgery that can arise after uh, the big intervention. So um, you can see here um, uh, the, the primary complications of foregut surgery, leaks, fistulas and dehiscences, understanding the pathophysiology is very important, always treat the underlying mechanism. This is a message to my colleagues endoscopists that treat these patients, but also for the surgeons that do reduce surgery in these patients. The endoscopic treatment plays a significant role for these cases. Early management is associated with the highest sex rate, and you should adjust the therapy according to the timing of the complication. I didn't spoke, I didn't say anything about enteral nutrition, but this is the key. You should treat, you should give food to these patients, either by uh, jejunostomy, either uh, by uh, nasogerinal uh, tubes. And this um, diet should be hyperproteic, of course, with vitamins, otherwise you will induce ketosis in these patients. And then, uh, as you saw, we do a lot of research in biomaterials because even if we do a lot of new technologies, new approaches in endoscopy, this is not enough. We need new uh, devices and new uh, technologies here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ivo. Um, we, are, we appreciate uh, that you, you know, sh showed us uh, new frontiers of treatment of what were and still are the most dreadful complication in uh, upper GI surgery that now have, uh, you know, um, very uh, different ways of being addressed by endoscopy. And we have a couple of questions with these regards, the, 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 a technical one and uh, and, uh, and, and another one, a futuristic one. The technical one is from a colleague, I guess, from Portugal. And she asks, what are the real limitations of resuturing? What are the, the real indication well knowing the limitation? Because what a surgeon can do, drain and resuture, uh, we will know that it is, uh, you know, usually a, a losing game. But uh, is endoscopy changing the rules of the game? I mean, are you uh, uh, thinking about new indication for suturing what a surgeon cannot? So, um, of course, this works in a very small portion of the patients when the, the dehiscences are very, very small. It would never fall on the mind to suture 50% uh, of an open dehiscence because there is infection and uh, it's, it's, it's not a win game. Then uh, the case that I showed, there's a very small uh, aperture and I suture it with a double layer. I place a tube in aspiration and it, it worked, it worked. Um, so uh, suturing it from the endoscopic side um, is different. As, uh, it, it was explained from me from a physiological point of view because we approach mucosa to mucosa, gastric to esophageal. So, um, or um, jejunum to esophagus. So, um, in this case, I didn't uh, burn the mucosa. Usually what we do, we expose both the sides. Either we do a small mucosectomy, either we uh, do APC, argon plasma, the esophagus and the jejunum. Uh, to destroy the mucosa and then we suture over just the submucosa to the submucosa of the two organs that should be um, sutured. But I repeat, this is only for very, very small um, openings. Uh, I suggest not to place over the scopes uh, clips here. I suggest not to place clips. Either you do suturing, either you do the vac, you place the vac stand, either you place as a sponge. But this patient should be first drained surgically, because mm -hmm. you're in the mediastinum. Uh, the, the second question regards the fact that, you know, the use of staminal cells was in the last years uh, considered as extremely promising in tissue regeneration in general. And uh, of course, uh, it was highlighted first in papers coming from the world of cardiovascular, now you are suggesting the use for fistulas, 
But what is intriguing our listeners is the fact that you said that with the technology of nanoparticles, you can bring inside inside mostly everything. Yeah. So going further in compared to what the stamina lab offered to us, and we now know limitations as unsuccess rate, what are new other compounds that you are thinking about when you say that these nanoparticles can bring in whatever you want? So the, as I said, the big issue, so you should, dif uh, uh, the, the differentiation should be done. The fat brings mesenchymal cells that are already differentiated and have very high anti-inflammatory potential and induce some neovascularization. Staminal cells are something different. So staminal cells can differentiate into the environment where they are. Uh, the problem of staminal cells is the lack of food. So uh, this is why staminal cells didn't work or, or work little only in, in some cases um, when were used in surgery because they're just placed and uh, there is a bunch of staminal cells and there is no, no oxygen, no water, nothing. And this is why there is no success. With the nuclear uh, resonance, with the magnetic resonance um, um, seeding, uh, every, cells, uh, every cell is equivalent on equivalent distance from the other one, other one, other one. So there is food for all the cells. And then um, this cells uh, start differentiating, in this case into esophageal tissue, in, uh, and create all the layers of the esophagus. Uh, regarding the nanocomposite materials like hydrogels, um, these materials uh, by definition are already rich in water and oxygen. So just by injecting this biocomponents inside uh, the, the tissues, the fistulas or the hair senses, um, we bring life to the cells. But I will, say, I will tell you more. Uh, it depends on the exposition. We, you can make program, you can program these materials uh, for lasting. Let's say it can last one hour, six hours, one week, one month, one year, and so on. And uh, you can program them uh, in... Uh, the liquid phase, solid phase. So let's say you inject it and uh, then you um, either spray something over, either uh, expose these substances to, to other materials and this can solidificate, can be fluid, can be morbid, can be solid, can phase from all the phases of the material. So this is, this is very important point. A last question for you. And uh, so somebody is congratulating. This is an enthusiastic pers perspective, but of course there is a difference in between pioneerism and evidence. Are you aware of any trials reinforcing the, you know, the route that you are on regarding different ways of fistula closures? Yes. So there are uh, some commercial um, uh, materials. Um, that you can buy, you can order, pre-order and so on, and uh, quite expensive. Uh, and the cells are not so rich in, uh, in the mesenchymal cells, can be autologous or heterologous. Um, some companies sell kits for the filtration, uh, but the difference uh, with ours is that ours is at cost zero. You need one centrifuge and you need the three filters get, that can be found in any Plastic, plastic, surgical, plastic surgery unit. And you need, of course, a plastic surgeon to take the fat um, because when you see these patients are usually cachectic and then you should be very good and an expert in finding the place where the fat is in this patient. So it's not very easy. This is probably the most difficult thing. And when you deal with these patients, you see that it's, it's quite, quite a problem. There are many, many trials. If you go on clinicaltrials.gov, you can see that there is a lot of research in this field. Uh, but what, what also we are doing a trial, we are doing a trial on fistulas, we are doing a trial on dehiscences, and we are doing a trial on Crohn's disease fistulas. And it, 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 the, 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 the results up, up to, until now are really amazing in these patients. But 
it is mostly due to the anti-inflammatory component of the of the um, material that is injected. So thank you very much. It's uh, it's been a pleasure to listen to your presentation. Congratulations for what you're doing. Uh, I see a lot of congratulations in the in the chat. So uh, thank you again, Ivo. Uh, I, there is no other question for you, so you are free to go. Thank uh, you. Thanks again. In, in the right. meantime, while our technicians are working, uh, trying to restore the connection with Professor Carneiro, who is still missing, we will go reverse. So I will ask the co-chair, John Cock, to introduce the second speaker. John? Yes, thank you, Domenico. It is... Uh... My pleasure to introduce uh, my friend Luigi Marano from the University of Siena, professor of the, the University of Siena, who is going to present uh, some clinical cases, trying to illustrate the importance of molecular biology in the diagnosis of gastric cancer. Luigi, the floor is yours. I uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, John. Uh, thank you, Professor Dugo, uh, for um, this kind invitation. And uh, I uh, uh, will speak about molecular classification and personalized treatment of upper GI malignancy with uh, uh, some clinical cases. Um, <clears throat> I will show you my screen. Full? Okay. So, more than a half of gastric we experience ineffectiveness of the one size fits all approach. So, we have to search for an answer in genomic and molecular profiling of gastric cancer. So, this is a crucial step into the gastric cancer treatment. Uh, and we have to step on molecular analysis of gastric cancer. Uh, as you can see here, in the new age of modern drugs, individualized treatment of patients and the modern surgical approaches in case of different cancers, we also have to change our point of view. Why? Why? Um, why? Because we uh, can offer to our patients a tailored treatment, a personalized surgery, a molecular-based surgery. He, uh, some years ago, uh, with my uh, director, Professor Riello, um, uh, we wrote a, an editorial, and we wrote that gastric cancer is not a single disease, but a conglomerate of histologically, biologically, and genetically heterogeneous diseases diseases conditioned by gradual accumulation of various genetic and epigenetic alterations leading to the activation of several molecular pathways resulting in a markedly different responses to the same treatment. So a very, uh, very important definition of uh, heterogeneity of gastric cancer and uh, that uh, actually uh, we have a route. This uh, route is going to different molecular classification of gastric cancer. Uh, first of all, we have to uh, account the TCGA classification in which we can big different classes. Uh, first of one is CIN, uh, EBV, MSI, and genomically stable. Uh, the other important classification is uh, uh, the classification by Christescu, the HERG, uh, in which um, uh, Christescu recognizes other four types uh, of molecular class classes, MSS TP53 negative, MSS TP53 positive, MSI and MSS EMT. But why uh, it's important to study um, the, the uh, molecular classification and how we can uh, be oriented to our clinical practice. First of all, the MSI is uh, the most important and most studied uh, molecular classes and his knowledge is imported from EBM. Uh, um, 
in uh, recent uh, meta analysis and systematic review uh, we find that uh, msi in gastric cancer is associated with uh, female gender older age intestinal lower histotype medium lower gastro location lack of lymph node metastasis and stage 1 2 tnm and better survival it's important to highlight that about 10 percent of all gastric cancer have a um, microsatellite instability uh, and in um, uh, this uh, meta-analysis, we uh, experienced also the benefit of overall survival uh, in favor of MSI. So, the, uh, our, our experience on uh, about uh, 1,500 patients operated for primary gastric cancer between 1990 and 2011 um, with uh, uh, the goal of R0 surgery, distal total gastrectomy uh, with D D2, D2 plus lymphadenectomy, DNA extraction from samples. Uh, we um, uh, proved also microsatellite analysis uh, and considered the MSI whenever uh, more than two markers showed instability on five losses. Uh, tumor and constitutional DNA were extracted using a commercially available DNA purification kit. Uh, in our paper, one of the subgroup is uh, microsatellite instability. Of course, this phenotype is characterized by an accumulation of numerous mutations in the genome in a majority in repetitive in, uh, sequences, microsatellite macro-satellites because of inactivation of DNA mismatch repair system. But the question is, there might be an association between MSI and the clinical pathological factors. The, the answer is yes. Uh, first of all, we can recognize the uh, link between MSI and the Loren classification and tumor position. Hundred patients, 23%. Uh, stratified analysis revealed a significant impact of MSI on prognosis in non cardiac tumors of intestinal type or tubular poorly differentiated histology, particularly in stages two and three. And uh, we have to highlight the better five years survival, see uh, about 17% versus uh, 14%. And in an Cox proportional hazard regression model, uh, we uh, can uh, <clears throat> highlight that MSI status as an independent predictor of survival with nodal status, surgical radicality, type of gastrectomy, depth of invasion, extent of lymphadenectomy, and advanced age. Uh, another uh, issue uh, of uh, high interest from a clinical point of view is the connection between MSI and the lymph node spread. Um, and uh, in, uh, in this uh, study from our group, we can say that uh, the MSI patients have a low uh, seeding of cells in lymph nodes in the first compartment, second compartment, and third compartment when compared with MSS uh, uh, biological molecular uh, classes. And um, it's important to highlight that MSI uh, very rarely can metastatize to uh, lymph nodes. As you can see here, uh, we have 53% of patients with, with the absence of uh, nodal metastasis versus 30% uh, of patients and uh, in uh, microsatellite stable. <clears throat> Another important point is uh, the um, uh, issue of uh, skip metastasis. Uh, in microsatellite stable patients, we have uh, 60, about 60% of uh, uh, skip metastasis and 0% in microsatellite instability group. And the rate of skip 
commit us is about uh, one to twenty one percent uh, uh, lymphatic compartment three point two percent of MSI versus fifty point three percent for MSS and as you can see here um, lymphovascular negative patients uh, fifty six percent of all microsatellite instability uh, uh, group that is a very important uh, group for uh, um, a think a future think of d1 resection so the theory the surgery uh, on on the basis of molecular classification uh, the one problem is the, that the lymphovascular status might, uh, might be analyzed from the final pathological examination and not from endoscopy biopsy. Another question is the uh, connection between MSI status and heart positive gastric cancer. As you can see here, macrosatellite stable patients uh, present a 10-year disease-specific survival of 9 and 0 respectively, uh, while uh, macrosatellite instability are positive where uh, about 40 percent uh, 30.8 and 50.4 percent and in the cox regression analysis uh, msi female uh, female and uh, t more than equal or more than three were significant significantly associated with uh, survival so the role of microsatellite instability also as a risk factor in gastric cancer. Another important uh, topic is the link between MSI and the synchronous stage 4 gastric cancer. As you can see, uh, stage 4 is less common in microsatellite instability patients, 80% than other stages, and no significant difference uh, between the clinical and the pathological characteristics of microsatellite instability and microsatellite stable were registered, with a, a, a median over survival of uh, about 16 months versus eight months between the two uh, molecular uh, groups. But the most important uh, um, connection with the uh, clinic with the uh, clinical approach is the link between microsatellite instability and the neoadjuvant chemo. As you can see here, uh, probably uh, patient with a, a microsatellite instability benefit uh, directly from upfront surgery, while uh, the uh, benefit from neoadjuvant chemo are very, uh, very uh, rare in this case. Uh, so we have to discuss also the link between MSI and PDL1 in gastric cancer, the classic trial. Uh, we have to note that the multivariable analysis of uh, disease free survival between uh, MSI, uh, H, and SPDL1 showed an independent prognostic role uh, of uh, MSI as we're well receiving chemotherapy. And although adjuvant chemo improved disease free survival in microsatellite stable patients, no benefit was observed in the macrosatellite instability group. And, um, and uh, this is another important message uh, from a clinical uh, point of view uh, with, a, uh, with a management implication. Uh, other analysis of <coughs> classification uh, are the EBV subtype that could have the best prognosis, uh, genomically stable subtype that uh, probably um, has the worst prognosis, and uh, multivariate Cox regression analysis, TGGA risk score and independent prognostic factor. So um, other two groups, C IN subtype according to TCGA classification experienced the greatest benefit from adjuvant chemo, uh, while genomically stable uh, subtype had the least benefit from adjuvant chemo. 
So uh, it's the time to move on uh, the search of other score. And in, uh, in this case, it's important to highlight the uh, immune score in gastric cancer. Uh, Luigi. So we... Yes, bro. Sorry, Luigi. I, I, I thank you so much to having introduced uh, this uh, topic because we had several difficulties in connecting with Professor Canero, who, who is online now. So I would ask you if it is the case, because I think it's more appropriate to leave her the introductory lecture about molecular classification so that you can close your presentation with the clinical case. Uh, I, 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 I know that you have uh, prepared uh, your clinical cases and if you are ready to do that, okay. I would be pleased to, uh, to go to this conclusion, give the mic to Professor Canero and leave the clinical case at the end. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. We, we, so I can start with the first clinical case. Uh, we um, uh, present uh, the, these, uh, uh, these case. Um, She's a 50 years old uh, patient uh, that uh, um, uh, presented uh, to our department with a history of uh, uh, anemia and uh, pain, abdominal pain. Her family history uh, was unremarkable, uh, even if uh, her mother uh, suffered from gastric uh, cancer. Uh, pathological history was um, uh, unremarkable. You can see that uh, at uh, endoscopy, um, we um, uh, highlight an infiltrating ulcerated lesion involving the sleeve gastric cantrum in its lower third. And uh, it, uh, the diagnosis from an histological point of view show the tubular uh, adenocarcinoma uh, G1. The CT scan of abdomen showed an extensive pathological concentric thickening of the gastric wall involving the lower third of the body and the anthropyloric uh, region with uh, lympho uh, with a um, node, uh, probably node involvement of max nine millimeters along the small curve and the uh, celiac axis. So, um, we, uh, um, uh, I would uh, uh, ask you uh, how would you proceed if she was your patient with total gastrectomy, subtotal gastrectomy, explorative laparoscopy, neurodivent chemo, or uh, CT PET scan? This is, of course, a, a question uh, for the audience. Please, everybody who is online can try to insert their answers on this uh, on this uh, sub menu, and we will see what happens. <coughs> so I think we can uh, go on. They are very shy, so please go on. Yes. So uh, at uh, of course. Uh, for, uh, forty-five percent prefer to uh, goes with. Is uh, of course staging laparoscopy. We perform staging laparoscopy. Uh, and no evidence of visible liver lesions or macroscopically evident peritoneal uh, disease with uh, uh, cytological uh, negativity. Uh, so we decide to uh, submit the, the, this patient to neoadjuvant chemo with a DOC scheme, uh, docetaxel suspended for liver toxicity and uh, uh, other three uh, complete cycles with oxaliplatin and uh, capricitabine. So at the, uh, after uh, the new chemo, uh, we can uh, highlight the dimensional reduction of T parameter equal to about 50% 
and uh, all uh, lymphadenopathies with dimensional reduction also for uh, some retroperitoneal lateral aortic lymph uh, lymphadenopathies, uh, station 16. And the patient was admitted to our department for uh, the uh, surgical plan. However, uh, at um, one month later, we performed another CT scan with a new dimensional increase of the T parameter with focal areas suggestive at least for T3 in the prepyloric area. And uh, uh, we uh, performed a subtotal gastrectomy, but uh, during operation, we uh, uh, performed also an intraoperative examination with uh, uh, not documentation of neoplastic proliferation. Uh, to the uh, final examination, we obtained a, a Ypsilon PT. Two and zero R zero cancer uh, with uh, no um, uh, involved nodes in sixteen uh, retrieved nodes. Becker uh, grade three and moderately differentiated papillary uh, G two. Uh, Her two was positive and microsatellite instability was low MSI low. Uh, Post-operative uh, course was uneventful. The patient uh, was submitted to surveillance program, and at follow-up of September 2022, she's alive. The second case is um, of another uh, patient um, uh, of uh, uh, 76 years old. Uh, female patients uh, and uh, she had no family history of cancer and no uh, pathological history of relevance. At February 2020, uh, uh, she underwent endoscopy that revealed the presence of a large neoplasm infiltrating the wall and the ulcerated in surface extending from the cardias to the angulus along the small curvature. Uh, and on the uh, biopsy, uh, uh, we obtained also an heart uh, sampling uh, that was negative. At the CT scan of staging, uh, we uh, see the liver of regular morphology and volume, probably with the direct infiltration of the lower edge of the left lobe uh, by, uh, by the cancer. So uh, we performed also diagnostic laparoscopy with no micro or uh, microscopic lesions. Uh, and uh, we um, uh, submit the patient to another uh, neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy with the Folfox scheme. But after second cycle of chemo, uh, patient X program was stopped. The restaging scan of chest. Uh, showed voluminous full thickness neoplasm of the upper and the middle third of the stomach extending from supracardial area uh, up to a, a few millimeters distal to the angulus. But uh, we also see the direct infiltration on second and third hepatic segments and the pancreas in correspondence of uh, uh, body tail. And the uh, radiological staging was uh, ER T4B and 3M1. Uh, why? Probably um, rad radiologist uh, saw uh, some um, thickening of the sheets of peritoneal reflection in the pelvic area with minimal aside. So the next question is, how would you proceed if she was your patient, one with a MRI or IPEC? Please, can we, can we have the question? Okay, thank you. Maybe that our listeners should know that now they have uh, an icon saying polls. 
And if you go in polls, you can use your screen in order to participate. And nobody did it the first time. I think this is useful if somebody does it, otherwise you, we should go on. I move on? Yes, please. So, mm, well, only 80% will perform a total gastrectomy, 32% high back. Mm. So, we performed a total gastrectomy uh, and experienced the um, uh, infiltration of uh, a pancreas behind the, uh, the stomach and uh, the left liver lobe, as you can see here. Uh, the final pathological reports showed a, a gastric cancer uh, of um, uh, 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 three Becker grid with uh, uh, five involved nodes on uh, six, seven uh, retrieved nodes and uh, final stage of uh, e, um, UPT4B and 2 R0. Uh, and the, inter uh, the, the date of uh, interest is that this patient was a microsatellite instability, MSIH. So, um, uh, this patient received hemotransfusion in the postoperative course and uh, was discharged in uh, after 18 days. But uh, she experienced also a durant chemo with the pactitaxel and the ramucirumab. And at the follow up, uh, she did. Survival, probably because uh, uh, the uh, pathological was R0, but probably um, uh, during surgery, uh, the question uh, is uh, probably we uh, uh, leave some uh, neoplastic tissue. Thank you very much and see you in Bordeaux. So we can discuss to all together these clinical cases. Th thank you, Luigi. This is great because you have shown up how, you know, Different ways of interpreting the heterogeneity of this disease leads us to different decisions based upon what we know today. And it's totally different in more than 50% what we would have done, you know, only five years ago. So I think this is the perfect introduction of the main lecturer of today. We are very pleased to have uh, today with us uh, as a guest and honor presenter, Professor Fant Fatima Carneiro. She's a uh, well-known pathologist working in Portugal, and she is a worldwide uh, maximum expert on the main topic of our webinar. I, if I, I see that she's online, I don't see her face. So please, uh, Professor Carneiro, show up. We are, listen, we are waiting for your uh, distinguished presentation. Uh, Professor Dominico, I, I was sending a message to Maria, hello, uh, because I had a serious problem at the hospital and I could not join before. So, uh, but... Uh, you are always welcome. You are totally excused. We are so oh my excited God, to have you with a us. Problem. There is 100 people online uh, looking forward to hear your presentation. So I'll try to, to do, let me see if I can share my presentation. I am so sorry for this. Can you see it? Yes, very well. Okay. So uh, in a way, I'll try to do, I was explaining to Maria, but I have not even sent the email that uh, I can be interrupted at any moment because there is an emergency at the hospital. But anyway, I'll try to deliver what uh, I, I, I have here to say. So, in a way, uh, I was asked to discuss implications of molecular classification in gastric cancer treatment. And uh, before that, I will have this on screen. And I apologize again, but it was completely out of my control. So, uh, before we jump to that, 
we have to be well aware that gastric cancer is extremely heterogeneous. It's not only geographical variation, but also the environmental causes, the genetic susceptibility, the clinical phenotypes, the morphological features, and the molecular landscapes. So this is really a challenge in everyday practice. And uh, so this is not only true for sporadic cancer, but also for hereditary cancer, although this accounts only for 1% to 3% of all the number of gastric cancers, let us say. So there is here heterogeneity in histopathology, molecular pathology, and of course, genetic susceptibility. And just to give an idea of these goals in real life, about 90% of gastric cancers, they are sporadic and only 10% are familial hereditary. And these are very important because you can search for the genetic cause that allows to spot the individuals who are at risk prior to disease development. But this is not what we'll address today. It's just the context. Just to give you an idea, this is a prophylactic astrectomy performed in the carrier of a CDH1 mutation that is the genetic cause of most cases of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. And uh, we can see in these lesions mainly very tiny intermucosal lesions and uh, interpetelial lesions and can pass in situ carcinoma and pastoid spread of signet ring cells. But the heterogeneity is as big as this. Sorry, Fatima. Yes. Uh, I am not sure that we are looking at what you are looking at because no? the slides in our uh, screen are always stuck on the number one. So if you please move to the to the you know screen sharing properly because we are stuck to the title of your presentation. You only see the title of the presentation. Yeah, yeah, we, we we want to to see the, every single slide because we were stuck on the first. Oh my God! But uh, for me, it is uh, it is very okay. I will try again. Yes, you are not sharing the entire presentation. You are sharing just a, a snitch. Oh my God! That makes no sense. Exactly. Let me try again then. Yes, please do it. It's not the first time this happens, but let me see now. Uh, and now, can you see entire presentation? Yes, try to go on. Sweet, go on. Okay. Okay, now it works perfectly. Okay. Perfect, perfect. perfect. So, okay, sorry. It is, you know, it is such a confusion today. So uh, I was saying, and I guess that you have heard, that gastric cancer is extremely heterogeneous. So I opt to give uh, for the those who attending are attending this course uh, the global context of gastric cancer. So as I said, uh, the most sporadic cancers occur in uh, most gastric cancers occur in a sporadic setting. And it's only a proportion of one to three percent that are hereditary. And there are histopathological features, molecular features that are very heterogeneous. And the genetic susceptibility is very important because only 10% of gastric cancer is familial or hereditary. And so they are genetically determined, which is very important because a lot of spotting individuals at high cancer risk prior to disease development. And uh, just to, to give an example of how heterogeneous the things can be, this is hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. And this is a prophylactic astrectomy performed in a symptomatic area of CDH1 mutation. It is highlighted the tiny spots where lesions could be observed by microscopy and could not be detected by microscopic observation. And in these lesions, you can see intermucosal signet ring cells or interpetelial lesions, such as in situ carcinoma and pastoid spread. This is completely different from what we have in advanced aggressive hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, in which you have the features of linitis plastica and you have this very aggressive phenotype with pleomorph bizarre cells with high mitotic index. 
so, uh, but this heterogeneity is also present in uh, sporadic AC cancer. And so that you have an idea, the morphology can be such uh, those I'm showing a polypoid feature, uh, fungating appearance, and in ulcerated lesion with thickened borders and the so-called limit is plastica that can occur in hereditary, as I showed, but also in sporadic setting. And when, when you go, to, we move now to histology. Histology of gastric cancer can also be very heterogeneous. And these are the main types, tubular, papillary, signet ring cells, and mucinous carcinoma. And if you come to the classification of gastric adenocarcinoma as uh, um, displayed in the last edition of WHO book on classification of the tumors of the digestive system, this chapter was prepared by European authors and Japanese authors and it is the rule of the game in all WHO books. And here you can see the features of the typical tubular adenocarcinoma with the tubules invading the muscle layer of the papular type with finger-like process. And there are fibrovascular cores lined by columnar cells. Here you have an example of what is currently designated. And I think this is very important for those who are listening currently. The designation by WHO is poorly cohesive carcinoma. Within this group, we can find those that are constituted mainly by signet ring cells and is designated as poorly cohesive carcinoma signet ring cell type. And the larger majority non-signet ring cell type, which is designated as poorly cohesive carcinoma not otherwise specified. Why am I saying this is because the prognosis of these subtypes of polyquisive carcinoma are very different. The signet ring cell type has a much better prognosis and survival of the patients than the polyquisive carcinoma not otherwise specified. I like this because uh, most uh, pathologists use the classification, the broad classification of lowering and these subtypes will be described as diffuse type of gassy cancer. And actually, this is very heterogeneous. And uh, when you compare the WHO classification 2019 with the Japanese classification 2017, you can see that there is a very good correspondence between WHO and Japanese classification. This is the signet ring cell type in the Japanese classification. That corresponds to the poorly cohesive carcinoma signet ring cell type in WHO. This is the poorly cohesive carcinoma not otherwise specified that the Japanese designate differently, designating as poor type 2. And this is the mucinous carcinoma. And the mucinous carcinoma, you should be aware, then can have, can have the features of intestinal type with glands or constituted by signet ring cells, the rule of the game is that in any circumstances, these neoplastic cells, they are floating in pools of extracellular mucin. And you have to be very strict with utilization of these terms. And there is another type of gastric cancer that people tend to forget, which is the designate mixed carcinoma. In these tumors, you have two components. You have one component that is constituted by uh, poorly cohesive cells and another component that is tubular or papillary. Is this relevant? This is extremely relevant because the poorly cohesive component tends to invade through the lymphatic vessels to the peritoneum, while the, the tubular or papillary tend to invade through the veins or perineural structures giving rise to hematogenic metastasis. So the same tumor has two patterns of dissemination and the prognosis of the patients with this type of cancer is really very poor, one of the poorest in gastric cancer. So when we compare, then this is important because people tend to consider that WHO classification is very different from the Japanese classification 
And here I compare the two classifications with Lorin's classification. And I want to show you that there is a perfect correspondence between the designations of this poorly cohesive carcinoma signet ring cell type in WHO that correspond to signet ring cell carcinoma in Japanese classification. And according to WHO, the poorly cohesive, not otherwise specified, corresponds to the poor too. These cases, which are completely different, as I mentioned, they correspond in Lorenz classification to diffuse type of gassy cancer. And this is very relevant for the users of our histopathological classifications. The mixed type of tumors, as I mentioned, they are very special because they have a very poor prognosis. And the Japanese, they describe these tumors according to the percentage of each of the component, that components that can be more than two. So what I'm showing is that for the main types of gassy cancer, there is a perfect correspondence between WHO and Japanese gassy cancer classification. Why do I mention this? I mention this because uh, people listening to this webinar, they are used to read the results of clinical trials and usually people tend to say that these classifications are very different and they are not. And we should get used to know the correspondence. But there is much more in Gassi cancer because there are histological variants that we should be aware of and that I will address briefly. Which are they? One is adenocarcinoma with enteroblastic differentiation this is a very peculiar type of gassy cancer that can have solid areas and tubular areas with apical clear cytoplasm and where you can also find iodine globules. This type of cancer, the epithelium reminds the fetal gut epithelium. That's where the name comes from, adenocarcinoma with enteroblastic differentiation. And one should be aware that this is considered as a variant of hepatoid carcinoma. And because of that, uh, of a fetoprotein is elevated in the plasma of these patients. We can add uh, special stainings such as glypican 3 salt 4 of a fetoprotein for the confirmation of the diagnosis. Another type of gassy cancer we should be aware of is the invasive micropapular adenocarcinoma. And here you have clusters, tumor clusters, that have the characteristic inside out growth. So there is not a lumen and the apical pole of the neoplastic cells is directly to the surface. And these nests of cells are within empty spaces, having this micropapular structure. Why are these two types of gassy cancer? They are very relevant because both of them they carry a very poor prognosis for the patients. Another type of gassy cancer is the designated gassy cancer with lymphoid stroma. And here, it's most of the cases are related to EBV infection, Epstein-Barr virus infection. We can detect that by special molecular means, mainly by in situ hybridization targeting EBV and cold small RNA, designated as EBR. And you can see that is positive in the nuclei of the neoplastic cells and is negative in the lymphocytes. Is this relevant? Yes, it is, because these cases, they have a very good prognosis. And it is important also to know that EBV-related gastric cancer can display other morphological features, such as adenocarcinoma with glandular structure and as you can see, there is positivity by Eber in the glandular epithelium or cases in which there is this Crohn's-like reaction with lymphoid follicles at the periphery of the tumors. And here you can see intense positivity for Eber. Why am I saying this? Because this is a pattern of gastric cancer, which now and then we pathologists can miss because we are not aware of these specific subtypes. And we have now new types of gassy cancer. They were recently described for the first time in Campus in WHO book. And this is a type of gassy cancer that is constituted by the fundic glands that become neoplastic 
they are anastomosing, irregular, and they can invade the submucosa. And the relevance of this type is that the prognosis of these tumors is very good. So in a way, what am I highlighting before jumping to molecular classification is that morphology by itself indicates which molecular features can be behind these different phenotypes. So, but before jumping to another issue, what I want to highlight for the moment is that WHO classification is quite similar to the Japanese classification and uh, we should take this in consideration. But what about the tumor biology? And before we go in depth in the molecular features, I want to begin by showing you this specific type of Gaussian cancer. This is very interesting. It is designated as Gaussian carcinoma with anastomosis glands or crawling light Gaussian cancer, in which you have these bizarre structures that remind you of the letters of the alphabet and the glands, they grow parallel to the surface of the mucosa. Why is this interesting? This is interesting, interesting because this type of gastric cancer, despite having glands, and I want to highlight that these glands, they are very rich in goblet cells. So there is a problem of differential diagnosis of a typical intestinal metaplasia. They display mutations in this gene, rho R mutations, and they display also fusions, including Claudine 18 in this type of intestinal type adenocarcinoma with the smosing glands. Several of you will know that these are the molecular features that are characteristic of diffuse type of gastric cancer, or if you prefer WHO, poorly cohesive carcinoma. Is this relevant? It is very relevant because this specific type of gastric cancer, this can be a new entity for most of you, uh, there is a feature which is the progression to signet ring cell carcinoma. So this type of cancer still at the phase of the glandular structure has the features of uh, signet ring cell carcinoma or diffuse carcinoma. And this is the explanation why this can be uh, wide, the presence of this component of signet ring cells. And this is the explanation why this is a genetic distinct group of tumors with these mutations and fusions, which are typical of the diffuse gastric cancers and justify the progression of this glandular-like tumor to diffuse gastric cancer, which is relevant and very new and we should take in consideration. But let's then approach briefly the classification, the molecular classifications of gastric cancer. I could not listen to the previous presentation and I guess this could have been addressed already, but we have, according to CTCGA, four main types of gastric cancer. Those related to Epstein-Barr virus infection, which is very relevant for us, for you clinicians, because in this type of gastric cancer, EBV related, there is overexpression of PDL1, PDL2. And this is very important for immunotherapy. You have the group of microsatellite cancer, gassy cancer, which is characterized by the somatic silencing of MLH1 gene by promoter methylation, and which features is the presence of microsatellite instability. These two types of gassy cancer, they are candidates for immunotherapy. You have the genomic stable. The genomic stable, as I mentioned before, this is mainly diffuse histology type, and the alterations are those of rho A mutations besides CDH1 mutation, and also the occurrence of the fusions of Claudine, encompassing Claudine 18. And this is by itself a specific type with a specific molecular characterization. What about the designate chromosomal instable gassy cancer? Here the histology is different, is intestinal histology, and it is where you have not only P53 mutations, but also have the activation 
of the tyrosine receptor kinases and where. And we have to highlight that it is within this group of gastric cancer that you have alterations of ER2 amplification. And you have the, the, the so-called Asian Cancer Research Group classification, which divides gastric cancer essentially in two groups, those that are microsatellite instable and those that are stable. Within the stable, then we have the, the groups of cases in which there is alteration of epithelium zinc hemal transition. This group corresponds entirely to genomic sta stable tumor with diffuse histology. And you have the group in which there is these are stable, so microsatellite instability is not present, but which are characterized by the presence or absence of alterations in P53. Is this relevant? It is because there is an impact in the prognosis of these patients. So it is essentially important for the understanding of the biology of these tumors and understanding the molecular features behind. To be completely honest, maybe because I'm more used to that, I prefer TCH, uh, TCGA classification, which I think is the one most widely used all over. So if for, if we have specific histologies, as I mentioned, and for a DV, we have gastric cancer with stroma, lymphoid stroma. And I want to highlight again that this type of morphology is characteristic by EBV-related tumors, but it is also the histotype that you can see in microsatellite in stable tumors. So the morphology is not easy for us to distinguish which molecular subtype is behind. So it means that when we have gastric cancer with lymphoid stroma, we pathologists are expected to search for EBV by EBOR, as I mentioned, and are expected to search for microsatellite instability. We know that microsatellite instability in not advanced tumors is related with good prognosis. Uh, but uh, is not the case when we consider the utilization of the specific treatments. So when we come on the basis of what I explained already to the specific treatments for gastric cancer, we have essentially those that I listed here. ER2 positivity, ER BB2 amplification, and I'm not going to show you the criteria for the classification of the positivity that can be graded in scores one, two, and three. Three is positive, no doubt. Score two needs uh, in, uh, in situ hybridization for the demonstration of the amplification of the gene. And these alterations are behind the use of terstuzumab, as you may know. For microsatellite instability I, and for tumors expressing PDL1, such as EBV related, and for tumors with high tumor mutation burden, the therapy that is currently accepted is immunotherapy. What about the other biomarkers that are not completely well established but under development? This encompass Claudine 18.2 for diffuse gastric cancer. And there are other genetic molecular alterations that we should be aware, such as fibroblastic growth factor rearrangement, metamplification, very rare end track fusions that currently are used for target therapy also, and these are gaining momentum, and we should be aware of that. What, uh, how has this been translated currently to the guidelines that are used for clinical practice? This has been translated to what I'm showing you now, which is the very recently published uh, ISMO clinical practice guideline for the diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up of gastric cancer. What we have here, we have the fields in which target therapy are important, and this target therapy is important mainly in advanced metastatic and receptable gastric cancer, 
in first-line treatment or second-line treatment? Where do we have our biomarkers? Which therapies are related to their detection? So the first-line treatment, we have chemotherapy. And if the tumor is positive for ER2, and by positivity, I explained already what is required. In addition to the chemotherapy, there is an addition of terstuzumab. So this is the current practice, practical guidelines that we should be aware. The other marker that we are requested now is the study of the expression of PDL1. And the PDL1 will lead to the addition of uh, now immunotherapy, mainly using nivolumab. We can discuss how we explore the expression of PDL1 and the shortcomings of this biomarker. In second line treatment, there are several indications that I'm not going to discuss, but there is the detection of microsatellite eye uh, or deficient of mismatch repair proteins, in which we detect by immunohistochemistry if the mismatch proteins are expressed or not. If deficient, this is equivalent to microsatellite eye, and this will lead to pembrolizumab monotherapy according to the current guidelines by ESMO. I guess uh, most of people listening to this talk will be aware of this, but we can discuss uh, specific details in the discussion part of the, the presentation. So this is essentially what I wanted to tell you, not to turn the presentation too heavy, and I prefer now that we come to the questions and answers so that uh, we can turn it more practical. Should I interrupt the sharing? The, yes, can I close yes, this? Yeah, yes, remain okay. online because there are, uh, I'm sure, a lot of comments and questions for you. And uh, yes. first of all, let me, th let me thank a lot for your presence. I know it's a difficult day. It was an we idea. We have a them. huge audience of young surgical oncologists who now have a much clearer light on what is well known but not well explained about heterogeneity of gastric cancer. Heterogeneity is probably one of the major obstacles that make this solid tumor more difficult to treat compared to others. My Absolutely. question for you is regarding heterogeneity because. It is not only an inter-case heterogeneities, but we have a lot of intra-case heterogeneities. Does it mean that we have, you know, uniquely appearing tumors when we look in the microscope to their structure, but inside of it, the molecular classification can be still applied in different proportions? Is that true or do you have a different explanation about heterogeneity as a pathologist? Uh, uh, well, I, I think uh, to begin with, all your comments make much sense. And I opted to show morphology because for us pathologists, it's important to understand molecular changes uh, on that basis. And to answer your question, I think the best model is the mixed type of gassy cancer because this is a challenge for treatment. Because in the same tumor you have a glandular in, that can be tubular or papular structure coexisting, for instance, with the diffuse or poorly cohesive component. And this is the challenge for treatment, which I think that currently the ESMO guidelines in a way try to overcome by the recommendation of a systematic search of the biomarkers always uh, when in presence of advanced tumors. So in a way, the therapy will be guided not only by the morphology, but mainly by the biomarker that may be present. And this type diffuse, this mixed type of gastric cancer, the biomarker that can be detected is for instance, ER2 in the glandular component. But uh, in parallel, that's why I brought the example of the crawling type gastric cancer, which still with the glandular structure, the molecular alterations behind are those that are characteristic 
of the poorly cohesive slash diffuse type of gastric cancer. And here the alterations are not those that are typical of the glandular tumors, but are typical of the diffuse or poorly cohesive. And in that sense, although the number of cases is very rare, I'm afraid that most pathologists cannot be aware, but because of the molecular alterations, if a treatment is considered, uh, uh, I, I mean a treatment together with chemotherapy, that should be directed to the Claudine 18 fusions because there is no target therapy directed to this specific molecular feature. So its morphology gives hints that are different according to subtypes. And I like very much this crawling-like type cancer because although you look to death and you think it's intestinal type, even with intestinal metaplasia, but the molecular alterations are typical of the poorly cohesive slash diffuse. So we really have to be aware of this. What I am in a way emphasizing, you can tell me, okay, that is really nice as a model of study, but those tumors are quite rare, right you are. But in a way they raise the, um, uh, the, the curiosity for some aspects that were not detected before. And now should, we should be aware of and search for alterations, these fusions that would guide the therapy in the different direction from those that are encompassed, for instance, in the completely established guidelines by ISMO. So besides those, we have to be aware of some particularities of gastric cancer with specific types. That is the point I wanted to emphasize. Yeah, thank you. It's very clear. I'm very thankful because this explanation was exactly what I wanted to hear, especially because we have an audience of young people. You know that this webinar was proposed and organized, your name was put up, by a young group of junior members of the upper GI group of the Education and Training Committee of European Society of Surgical Oncology. We have here John Koch, uh, Jan, Jan uh, Willem uh, uh, Van der Berg and Luigi Marano, they are, uh, you know, bright components of these subgroups. I wonder if uh, John or Luigi or Jan have some comments and some answer, uh, some questions to pose to you in the conclusion of this uh, interesting webinar. Are you there, boys? Yes. At least Luigi is there and John also. I'm sure they want to ask yes. questions. Yes. Well, uh, Professor Carneiro and Luigi, thank you very much for your wonderful presentations. And uh, I think that from the surgical oncologist point of view, it's clear that, that this is the direction we need to go. Uh, but I would like to, to make some comments from the general surgeon point of view, yeah. which is uh, the, the, the reality most hospitals have in, in Europe. And uh, of course, we, after... Uh, Listening to your speech, Dr. Carnero, we would like to have you as our pathologist. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> this is not the case. And uh, I am aware that in, in the last ESMO guidelines, you suggest that from the uh, um, endoscopy biopsies, we make an interpretation from the point of view of histology and the point of view of molecule, molecular biology. Sometimes it is difficult uh, because um, maybe because of uh, the lack of uh, right amount of, of tissue to do this. And on the other hand, we have that uh, maybe we can do this, but in, in, in countries like in, here in Spain or in, in Italy, for example, we still don't have uh, the possibility to use uh, immunotherapy in these patients. Mm. So it can be difficult for uh, to implement it. Yeah? Yes, you know, ESO is working together with the uh, European uh, Union to make this possible. But what would be your advice for for in, in this kind of situation? Should we start from the? Uh, should we use molecular biology uh, since the uh, endoscopic biopsy? Should we use it only? in uh, metastatic disease? Yes, this is an extremely relevant question. 
And uh, just to be completely honest, I've been in a meeting, uh, GI meeting in Graz very re recently, one week ago, and this was one of the issues that was discussed. And there was even a survey where do you perform molecular characterization of gastric cancer. And uh, there will happen a Congress, mainly by surgeons uh, in Bertinoro very soon, in which there was a survey and this was one question also. And I've been discussing this with the pathologist we may know, Professor Eike Grabsch. She is from working in UK, now is in Maastricht in the Netherlands. And we were commenting among us because we'll have to discuss these issues. And she said, in UK and in the Netherlands, we do not perform molecular characterization upfront. In other places, and I know, for instance, in Spain, because you mentioned, in very sophisticated centers, every case is submitted to molecular characterization. So in a way, what is our compromise? Why do people say we do not perform upfront? Because this molecular subtyping is expensive and uh, maybe not fruitful because you can have the results for the three main biomarkers, ER2, which is very expensive, the immunohistochemistry, PDL1 expression, microsatellite instability, which is more manageable in terms of costs. But many of the cases, the patient will not benefit from this knowledge up front. So the compromise that at the hospital we adhere to on the decision of the clinicians is every gastric cancer case is discussed in a tumor board. So the clinicians analyze surgeons, medical oncologists, gastroenterologists, and they decide which type of treatment they will, they will use if necessary. So not uh, in uh, localized, but in advanced cancer, and they decide which they consider will be putative for target treatment. And we perform according to the clinical request. Like this, the clinicians know very well if the, it was localized and surgery was completely and curative, or if it is advanced and additional treatment will be necessary. This is something that many times is not known uh, at the phase in which the patient is submitted to endoscopic biopsies. But for those cases in which endoscopic biopsies are uh, performed systematically, there is something that I would like to highlight, maybe not for this audience mainly composed by surgeons, but as a request to their endoscopists. Gastric cancer is so heterogeneous that to be on the safe side regarding a good representation of the tumor, at least eight biopsies should be performed. And tumors, unfortunately, they are very big. And this is not too much. Otherwise, many times you have superficial mucosa, we have necrosis, and you cannot provide not even a morphological diagnosis. So I think it was clear what I said. If in yeah. your environment and whatever, it's your definition, your decision, uh, deciding the therapy only after the tumor board, which I agree with, mainly if you had to think very carefully about expenses and benefits, but anyway, you have the endoscopic biopsies, just dialogue with your endoscopists and ask them to get, uh, for instance, this is clear demonstrated for ER2 alterations, uh, the safe number of biopsies is at least five, preferably eight to have the grounds, to have a, a result that you can take with more uh, to be more sure about uh, being really what is happening in that tumor. Fatima, with regards of this issue, I mean, the scarce availability in all centers of all the resources that we have in order to subclassify and evaluate how to subtype tumors for differentiate treatment, I feel the duty to pass you a question that comes from the audience. It's a colleague, I don't know where he's calling from. The name is Alex Muturi. 
please, Dr. Muturi, if you hear, specify where you are calling from. And he says, if I got Professor Fatima correctly, if at histology the gastric cancer has abundance of lymphoid cells, shall we need to request for EBV testing and uh, microsatellite instability status? Is, is that the first line of what we have to implement at our hospital? I have to translate. Yes, I understand perfectly. And in our practice, if the tumor is, as the person who asked the question implies, gastric cancer with lymphoid stroma, it is our routine upfront to, to perform EBV and microsatellite instability because this is a histotype that can come together with one or the other. So if you only perform microsatellite instability, we can not have full response and it is negative and you think it's not a candidate for immunotherapy, but EBV is also a candidate for immunotherapy. There is expression of pdl one and in our practice, with very specific histotypes, such as the one that was mentioned, we performed reflexively uh, the search for EBV and microsatellite instability. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there is here one point that uh, was not uh, touched yet, that in other types of cancer, for instance, in lung cancer, up front, we perform a series of molecular studies and we search for the expression of PDL1. And uh, I wanted to highlight that the evaluation of PDL1 in gassy cancer is very specific and is uh, quite difficult, is the so called CPS system. And contrary to lung cancer, for instance, in which you search only for immunoreactivity at the cell membrane of the neoplastic cells, in gassy cancer, you have to count the stromal cells, lymphocytes, macrophages, and separately the neoplastic cells. And there is an algorithm to come up to the conclusion. This is extremely difficult. It is extremely demanding. And it is not, on, it is not a big problem only because for gastric cancer, the cutoffs are very low, something like higher than 1%, otherwise it would be a nightmare. But there are some treatments that require more specifications, such as higher than 5%, higher than 10%. Why do I bring this? Because I've not touched and I wanted to touch, because you have to think today and dreaming of the future. My dream, I want to tell you, is to have algorithms of analysis that can be applied to specific cases and from that to have objective reproducible results because the inter-heterogeneity among different observers is very high. And the consequences I said for gastric cancer are not that tremendously uh, dangerous because the cutoffs are low. So either it is negative or if it is positive easily, you can count one other cells and yeah. see where the immunoreactivity is. So my dream is that these algorithms of analysis that have been developed already, they can be spread and people can have access to something that I've not mentioned, which is the possibility of having digitalization scan slides and apply the algorithms to these digital images. But algorithms, as you mentioned, needs data mining and data should be very homogeneous in order to be collected in large numbers. So you have shown that even if there are much similarities, the molecular classification that is adopted now in, in, uh, in Japan and mainly in all the Far East is a little bit different from the, from the, you know, the one that uh, derived from the publication on nature in 2014. So uh, there yeah. is a long way to go for uh, speaking the same language, data mine the same kind of information, encourage all institutions with large series to uh, collect you know, molecular information the same way, and algorithm will become a truth, will become very soon uh, the, the future yes. decision-making platform. Yes. Right? And uh, Professor Dominic Dugo, uh, I don't want to go in that direction because that is very much the future. 
but uh, there are currently some uh, artificial intelligence uh, approaches that uh, on the basis of a huge number, as you mentioned, data mining from huge numbers of cases, uh, these systems are able to figure out the molecular subtypes of gastric cancer. I'm not anxious for that because I like to look at histology. I like to search for the alterations. But what I'm really anxious to have in our routine everywhere is the algorithms of analysis of very specific biomarkers that will be used as the base for target therapy. But for instance, for those who are so believers in artificial intelligence, they believe that uh, what artificial intelligence will allow. We have the glass slides, we have the scan slides, and this can be analyzed according to artificial intelligence systems and you can get what the histotype can be. And people claim that is at a certain time point of our development will give us the results on the basis of these artificial, artificial intelligence systems with a very low cost because we will not perform the search of the biomarkers, but we'll have the classification at a certain time point and these will be faster, less expensive, and may be applicable in many parts of the world in which yeah. only histology is available. Fatima, so the I am so there. The future is there. Yeah, thanks again. Also for this uh, uh, visionary, uh, you know, description of what will be the future, will be much probably will be uh, next future. I am so thankful that you wanted to give to our young audience of 100 surgical oncologists, mainly from all over the world, the opportunity of listening to your enlightening lecture. It is always a pleasure and we have <laughs> always something to learn from your lecture. I, I like it so much. Um, this is, boys, this is your last occasion, your last chance. Fatima is very busy. So if you have any question, please do it now or be silent until Bertinoro meeting. <laughs> You can always drop a message by email. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So uh, we still have 80 people online. They must be very tired because they are too shy and I don't see any specific question. So if it is everything okay for all of you, again, I would uh, uh, thank the you know, General Secretary of ESO for organizing such a nice webinar.